RP Plus RPU, welcome back. Dr. James Hoffman here, and we're gonna continue on with our discussions on some basic physiological concepts. So today we're on basics of physiology. This is part two. If you haven't had a chance to watch the first part, make sure you go back and watch the first one. Otherwise, some of these things might not make as much sense as they could. If you have been, Great, we're gonna hop right in. Today's discussion is gonna be a really, really interesting topic. We're gonna to be talking about the concept of homeostasis and how that's regulated within the body. So homeostasis is something that you've probably heard us talking about before in a lot of our different videos. So today what I wanna do is just kind of give you a fundamental understanding of some of the things that we're talking about when we're talking about how the body maintains homeostasis and some of the underlying mechanisms in which that is being done. Now this isn't gonna be all inclusive by any means. This is meant to just kind of introduce you to the topic for, and kind of feed your um, hunger for future discussions on this. So. Let's get started, first slide. So when we're talking about homeostasis, right, this is essentially the, the way the body kind of maintains a kind of normal or regulated state. So we can look at it all the way at the system level, right, which is whatever body systems that we're interested in looking in. It could be the endocrine system, can be uh, blood balance of certain uh, chemicals or pH, can be all sorts of different stuff, right? We can also look at kind of a systemic effect of the homeostasis of the organism, which can be difficult to narrow down, but we can kind of talk about the organism in flux in terms of stress and strain relationships. More often than not, in exercise physiology, we're gonna be looking at it at the body systems level. Where we're gonna see how does exercise or certain stressors like maybe temperature or altitude affect different physiological variables like heart rate, blood pressure, blood concentration of certain ions, things like that, right? So essentially, we're trying to figure out what is kind of the normal resting condition for this system, whatever it is we're looking at, or the body, right? So we have kind of a normal operating range. We know that internal and external stressors can kind of create some physiological changes in the body and get us outside of our normal kind of accepted ranges, right? And this is really obvious. If you go and do exercise, right off the bat, we can start to generate some internal stressors and we might have external stressors like heat uh, from the outside, humidity, temperature, altitude, all sorts of crazy stuff. We know that those stressors are gonna start to result in some changes in our body, right? Why do we see those changes? Well, essentially, we're taking our body outside of its normal resting state is kind of exiting its maybe upper or lower bounds for certain characteristics, and we need to bring it back into a manageable range. Now, we have a lot of different strategies in which we can maintain homeostasis. And it says most, but not all systems, use a variety of short-term and long-term strategies to lessen the degree of change experienced from some of those stressors on the body. So essentially, we kind of have a combination of two principles that you've probably already heard of, right? We have the overload principle that says, hey, the stimulus that we uh, impose on the body has to be disruptive, so disruptive that it takes the organism out of their homeostatic state, right? And we also have stimulus recovery adaptation that says once an overload has been uh, delivered, there is a re refractory kind of recovery time. And then if conditions are good, we can actually see adaptations to that stressor, right? So essentially, what we have in the body are physiological responses that help manage these stressors in the acute sense. And then in the long term, we have chronic adaptations, which will kind of help lessen the degree of severity when we experience a stressor again. So if I go and do some type of training session or I go out in the heat, it stresses my body a little bit. Hopefully it stresses it to the point of what we call strain, which is an overload on the system, right? And then my body will start to make some changes so that when I experience that same stressor again, it will not be as impactful or will not be as disruptive on my homeostatic resting state the next time. That's kind of one of the central purposes behind making training-based adaptations. Make sense so far? So again, homeostasis is kind of maintaining balance, maintaining regularity, maintaining equilibrium for a lot of our different body system structures and functions. So let's go on to the next one. So now generally in exercise physiology, when we're talking about a stressor, we're usually looking at some type of external stimulus or maybe an internal one that's generated from exercise that is causing the organism person to experience some type of stress, right? A stress response is usually some type of physical, chemical, or psychological change that occurs as a result of whatever stressor is being imposed on the body. So for something to be stressful, generally it has to result in a chemical, physical, or psychological change. And that's pretty normal, right? So for example, when you start exercising, the metabolic demand goes up, oxygen intake goes up to meet some of these changes, right? 
nothing crazy there. So we know that stress responses occur constantly within the body at all times. We don't even think about it because these things happen all the time, right? We are constantly, constantly maintaining our own homeostasis at rest. And when we do light exercise or when somebody calls you on the phone and you get really excited, right? When you're texting your girl or boyfriend, whatever, we have to maintain kind of our normal homeostatic uh, point at all times. So we do this all the time. We don't even think about it, right? Now, normally, a lot of these stressors, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, they're very easily managed within our homeostatic boundaries. We have a lot of buffering within homeostasis, meaning we encounter stressors, but we can push back a little bit and it doesn't really seem to take us outside of our kind of functional range for whatever variables that we're looking at. So under normal conditions, we can buffer a lot of those stressors, right? No big deal. We still stay in our kind of normal um, resting state. Now, unfortunately, we can experience stressors that are so large that they drive us outside of our buffering zone, outside of our upper and lower balance for homeostasis, right? So essentially, we have some stressor, we push back, we push back, we push back, but that stressor can be so big, and our, you know, usually what we're talking about is exercise, is so big that it starts to create a physiological strain, right? So no longer are we just trying to push back and maintain. Now we've actually stressed the system so hard we've gone outside of our normal boundaries and that will be the driving force behind us making a change as a result of that stimulus. So we're going to start to see adaptations to the stressors imposed, right? And this is something hopefully is very intuitive. Most of you have probably heard of this before. But again, in order for us to make a chronic change, an adaptation, we have to actually present an overload. And what that means is we have to take our system, our body system, whatever it is, outside of its normal working range, outside of our normal homeostatic range of operation, outside of our buffering capacity, and now we have actually exceeded that. So it's created some type of physiological strain. Let's go on to the next one. So again, stressors usually result in a, an acute physiological response, right? Which is usually kind of a feedback mechanism to lessen the effect and maintain a normal homeostatic range, kind of a buffering effect, used to regulate whatever stressors that we're encountering. A strain, on the other hand, is when we have an overloading stimulus resulting in a chronic adaptation of the body, right? And this is a long-term change to lessen the homeostatic disruption of the stimulus that was experienced. So sometimes people confuse these ideas with like evolutionary um, adaptation, right? Whereas these are directed, these are driven based on the actual stimulus that was experienced, right? So all the things that change as a result of doing exercise, getting bigger, faster, stronger, leaner, more fatigue resistant, right? These are changes that are directed by the stressors imposed on the body. And maybe you've heard of the uh, what, what we used to call the SAID principle, S-A-I-D, which stands for Specific Adaptations to Imposed Demands. Same idea here, right? Your body will adapt to the stressors that you impose on it. Whereas evolutionary adaptations are completely random, right? These are not things that we can necessarily choose. They just happen. And in an from an evolutionary standpoint, people who tend to survive make adaptations that are favorable, right? It's not that your body chose to become certain ways. It just happened to do that and your ancestors happened to do that. They were successful, they had progeny, and then you are a result of that progeny, right? So they're just two different things. Evolutionary adaptations are just completely random, whereas exercise-based adaptations are specific to the actual stress ores imposed. And again, normally stressors is not a big deal. We buffer them, maintain homeostasis, an overloading stressor will force a change in the long term so that we can dampen the effect of that stressor. Make sense? Nothing too crazy yet? Sticking with me? Awesome. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so there's a lot of different body systems that operate on homeostatic regulation. Just to list a couple here, if you look at the slide, we have things like your core temperature is very, very tightly regulated, blood glucose, very tightly regulated, oxygen content, blood pressure, the amount of water that you actually carry around in your body, the pH balance of the actual tissues and then of the blood is very, very well regulated. And then even things like extracellular ion concentrations, when we have to actually create concentration gradients across certain membranes, are very, very tightly regulated. So all of these things have kind of a normal operating range, and they can get kind of whacked out when we start to encounter stressors, right? In the short term, we can buffer that. In the long term, we might actually make some long-term changes to lessen the effect of some of these imposed stressors. So these are just not an all-inclusive list by any means, but here's just some examples of systems that operate on this idea of homeostasis, okay? Let's go on. So one thing that we want to establish about homeostasis is that it operates on what we call kind of set points. And I think a lot of people 
tend to think of this as kind of like a one numerical kind of thing where they say, okay, blood glucose should be this number. Blood pressure should be this number, right? The amount of sodium should be this number. But really what we're talking about is managing kind of an operational range. So the way I like to think about it is there's a set point, which is kind of an average number, but then there's also kind of an upper and lower boundary that we're staying within. Because at any given time, we're gonna see all of our body systems, all of those variables are gonna be waxing and waning a little bit depending on what stressors are going on at the time. And that's totally normal, no big deal. So we wanna think of homeostasis this is kind of an operational range of scores for any given variable in any given body system, right? And if you take a look over here on the slide, we have some examples of ways that we can control that. So again, I like to think of it in terms of upper and lower boundaries. So we have kind of a functional operating range that we wanna work in. If we go outside of that range, now we encounter a physiological strain, which will result in the recovery adaptive processes being kicked in, right? So the way that we do that is through a couple big mechanisms. The first one is called negative feedback. And then the second one is called positive feedback, right? So in the example on the pictures on the slide, hopefully you can see okay, if not, no big deal. You you can just Google it and you can see plenty of examples of this. A negative feedback control system essentially is a result of encountering a stimulus. We pick up on changes as a result of that stimulus. We have our brain centers detect it and they say, okay, you know what? I'm going to send out an effector, something that is going to seek to oppose those changes, right? So in a negative feedback loop, we are essentially eliciting an effect that will oppose the changes that are occurring. We're trying to reverse what is happening, right? And this happens all the time. And this is one of our primary control mechanisms. So something gets out of whack, our brain picks up on it, whether it's temperature or pressure or chemical imbalances. We pick up on that, we send a message up to the brain, brain sends a message back to an effector that says, you know what, we need to get that back in check, right? So a negative feedback loop basically tries to either inhibit or suppress the negative effects being experienced by the stressor. So it tries to pull it back into its normal range. Whereas a positive feedback loop is slightly different. And this is something that we don't see as frequently in homeostatic regulation. It's something that can be used in very, very um, specific circumstances like uh, giving birth or orgasms or things like that. We don't see it quite as much, but it is worth noting. And a positive feedback loop is something essentially that picks up on a stressor and actually starts to amplify those changes that are being occurred, right? So sometimes changes can be positive, like in the example of giving birth, right? Like things like contractions, that's normal. And so a positive feedback loop will pick up on a change. It will detect a change, send messages that say, you know what, keep doing whatever's going. We want that to keep going up until it's done, right? So more often than not, when we're talking about maintenance of homeostasis, we're looking at negative feedback where we see a change, a stressor causing some type of variable change, starting to move outside of our operational range. We see negative feedback coming in saying, we need to put a kibosh on that, make sure that we're still in our operational ranges, right? And so we can just see some examples of that on the slide here. We got positive and negative feedback loops. Again, negative feedback being more common in our homeostatic regulation discussion. Cool? Next one. So we know that a lot of these negative and positive feedback loops operate through chemical messengers, right? Chemical messengers are kind of the male system of the body. We know that chemical messengers come in on a variety of different compounds and are used to transmit either instructions or signals to other parts of the body. And they use this for homeostatic regulation all the time. So essentially what we're looking at are chemical messengers, like I said, is kind of like mail, right? So the body sends out mail that says, hey, we need to make a change here, need to make a change there, need to make a really big change downstream, maybe through the blood at something else, right? So we do that through a couple different processes, right? The couple of big ones are cellular signaling processes. The first one, which you might see referred to in the future, is autocrine signaling, which is where we use chemicals to actually make signal changes within the cell itself, right? So autocrine changes are a result of chemical signals, which can be ions, can be proteins, things like that, that affect within the exact same cell that the uh, stimulus is occurring in. So it only stays within itself, right? Only stays within the same cell. So we have some type of stimulus, maybe we need to activate protein synthesis for some various characteristics. We will send a protein out to an effector cell within the cell, excuse me, an effector organelle within the cell, and that's it, no change after that, right? It just stays within the cell. Paracrine, on the other hand, is slightly different. Paracrine signaling is using chemical messengers to actually affect nearby cells. So instead of staying within the cell, we can actually start to see chemical signals that will start targeting the cells 
adjacent or very close to whichever cell is the site of the target, right? So very, very common. We see paracrine signaling activating kind of local area effects, right? Where we have the cells are talking to the cells next to each other. And then on a bigger scale, we have what we call endocrine signaling, which is the one I think most people are most familiar with. This is kind of like hormonal regulation. This is where we can actually see long range effects of cell, uh, excuse me, chemical messengers. So we might release a hormone that is released into the bloodstream. It might have started somewhere up in the brain, make its way into the bloodstream, and it might have an effect somewhere on a target cell, like a muscle cell somewhere else in the body, right? So we can kind of see kind of a scaling here, autocrine within the same cell, paracrine nearby cells, and then endocrine is more of a systemic chemical messenger effect where we can release things into the blood and they can basically make their way all across the body to have an effect on a different organ somewhere else. Make sense? You'll hear this more and more and more as you dive deeper into exercise physiology. For now, we just need to get kind of an understanding of autocrine, same, paracrine, nearby, endocrine, system-wide. Okay, so on the topic of endocrine regulation, the first thing that usually comes to mind is hormonal regulation, right? So hormones are proteins, right? So we know that proteins are made of chains of amino acids. So we know that hormones are usually secreted by specific organs. So each hormone has a specific organ that it's related to. We also know that they are generally transmitted through the blood and different tissues have very, very specific cell receptors either on the cell membrane or within the cell itself for those specific hormones. So it's really, really interesting. So just because you have something like insulin or testosterone or cortisol floating through the blood doesn't mean that it's activating everything along the way, right? Essentially what we have are very, very specific kind of like a baseball and a catcher's mitt on cell surface. And so testosterone or insulin or something might be floating around and it has to make a perfect fit on that cell membrane, right? So if you have, or kind of like a, the old block circle triangle children's game, you gotta make sure you put the right block through the right hole, right? In this case, what we have with hormones is there are very specific cell receptors on the surface. If it doesn't fit, it does not activate the cell. Now, when it does fit, when we have something like an insulin molecule uh, floating around and it actually hits an insulin receptor on the cell, then it will actually start to affect whatever cell that it hit. It could be a muscle cell, it could be any number of things, right? So if you take a look at the diagram over here, we have an example, and this is from the um, You Can Drip Sport Nutrition book. Uh, we have an example, so we had cortisol was floating around in the blood. It had a target cell that it was trying to hit. We had the receptor activated at the cell membrane. The receptor actually then gets targeted, gets activated, makes its way into activating into the nucleus. The nucleus starts transcript, excuse me, transcribing and translating proteins for whatever thing that we needed to occur. That turns into a messenger RNA, which we talked about in the last lecture. The mRNA makes its way over to the ribosome where it becomes a protein, which then acts as another chemical messenger for something else, right? To so say this needs to become activated or inhibited, right? So Hormones are used essentially to control the activity of whatever target tissue that we're looking at, right? So it can be used to activate stress responses. It can be used to activate anabolic or catabolic responses, any number of things. And when you guys get a little deeper into the exercise physiology literature, you'll see there are a number of different hormones, all of which have a unique starting place and all of which have unique effects. So it's pretty, pretty cool. So we know that hormones, <laughs> hormones? hormones are proteins that are sent, right? through the blood and have specific target receptors on the cell, which then activate very, very specific effects on different organs throughout the body. Pretty neat stuff. Okay, so on the next slide, we can just see, here's kind of an example of hormonal regulation. And then this is actually a cool example of uh, negative feedback as well. So this is also, I believe this is from uh, the Bernadotte uh, Sport Nutrition, Advanced Sport Nutrition book. And here we can just see, okay, we have the pancreas. The pancreas can help release either insulin from the beta cells or uh, glucagon from the alpha cells. And here we have examples of what negative feedback might look like. So in the example of having low blood sugar, we have a homeostatic range of blood sugar that we operate in. Once we start getting too low outside of our normal operating range, we start to pick up on that. We say, you know what? There's not enough glucose in the blood. The alpha cells of the pancreas will start releasing glucagon, which is a catabolic hormone, which will start to stimulate the breakdown of glycogen in the liver to re-elevate blood glucose back into its normal resting range, right? So again, we had our homeostatic regulation. This one was through endocrine control. On the polar opposite end, when we have high blood sugar, so now we have blood sugar going above our operational range, too high, possibly going into like a toxic range. In some cases, not always. 
We can see the uh, beta cells of the pancreas start releasing insulin. Insulin has an anabolic effect, meaning it's going to pull things out of the blood and bring them into cells to be built up for structure. Uh, excuse me. So in this case, what we're going to see is the alpha cells, excuse me, the beta cells releasing insulin. Insulin will have an anabolic effect. It will start pulling blood glucose out of the blood to be stored in the muscle or the liver as glycogen or potentially be stored for later use as fat, right? That allows us to maintain a normal range of blood glucose without it becoming too toxic for the body. So just an example of not only negative feedback, but of endocrine control of negative feedback on a couple different ends. So I kind of, I really like that to, uh, figure. Let's move on to the next one. Another chemical messenger that is noteworthy for exercise physiology is the use of neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. So neurotransmitters are really, really neat uh, structurally because they can vary in size. They're as tiny as single amino acids, which is really, really small in terms of, you know, for the body. And then they can also be gigantic, huge peptide uh, protein chain molecules where they're just really, really large, right? So they really do vary in size. And the cool thing about neurotransmitters is they actually allow communication between different nerve cells to conduct electrical signals down each nerve cell, right? So we can see a diagram over here on the right-hand side where we have the axon terminal of one nerve, which is sending an electrical signal to the dendrite of another nerve, right? And in order to do that, we need to have a neurotransmitter to help spread the gap between the two cells, right? So in this case, if you look, we have the neurotransmitter, which is enclosed in that synaptic vesicle. Remember vesicles from our previous discussion? So that's kind of that membrane enclosure. It makes its way over to a voltage-gated calcium channel and eventually will spill across the membrane and allow the cell receptors to pick up on that chemical signal and then allow that electrical signal to be conducted across the nerves. Really, really cool, right? And so there's lots and lots of really, really cool, interesting uh, neuromuscular stuff we can talk about in exercise physiology. This is just a really, really simple example. So in order for those nerves to communicate with each other, we do have to span the gap with a chemical messenger. So we, uh, we use things like acetylcholine, which can be uh, excuse me, secreted by synaptic vesicles at the nerve terminal end, and then will be received by, again, specific receptors at the surface of the target cell. Now, one thing that's really neat about neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, is we always just assume that it's kind of like a positive thing where it turns things on. That is partially true, but one of the neat things that's noteworthy about neurotransmitters is they can also inhibit things, right? So just because we're seeing electrical conduction doesn't mean that it's turning processes on exclusively along the way. That's part of it. It does turn things on and does communicate to say, hey, this needs to be activated or this needs to be ramped up. But it also has an inhibitory effect where it says, hey, we picked up on too many of these products. We need to back off of this bioenergetic pathway or this, this reaction because we're accumulating too much product, right? Or something along those lines. We can actually inhibit things as well. We say, hit the brakes on this, activate this. So neurotransmitters are another really, really big uh, part of cellular communication. So very, very similar to hormones, in this case, a little bit more specific to nerve cells and nerve communication. And so on the next slide, we can see just another example of that. Here we have a neuron on the left figure that is sending the signal to a targeting receiving neuron. And we see that kind of similar diagram here where we have the neurotransmitter. It's enclosed in the vesicle. It spills its neurotransmitter across the membrane here. There are specific receptors at the target cell on the surface that picks up on things like acetylcholine, it grabs it, it says, bingo, good to go. And then it fires the electrical signal. And then in some case, sometimes like the vesicle can be either destroyed or reused, things like that. And we see a lot of interesting things going on, but basically the same idea in this figure. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So we know that a lot of different processes operate on chemical messengers, and we also operate on positive and negative feedback. We know that in addition to some of those chemical messengers, a lot of the process, excuse me, processes and regulation is done based on the presence or absence of certain molecules, ions, and what I like to describe as products or reactants. So I was biochemistry major, bear with me, this is the terms that we like to use. So one of the things that we see in a lot of metabolic regulatory pathways is the presence or accumulation of certain chemicals like ADP, AMP, inorganic phosphates, things like that, can actually have an activating or inhibiting effect, negative feedback result, or signal cascade for a number of different processes, which is really cool. So essentially what we see is, if certain reactions are happening to very, very high degrees, that usually means we will start to see an accumulation of the products of that reaction. So for each reaction, we have reactants leading to products, right? When we have lots and lots of products accumulating, that can be a chemical signal that says, hey, 
something crazy is going on. For example, like when we start accumulating ADPs, that's usually a signal to the body that, hey, there's some intense exercise going on. I might need to start activating other enzymes for things like glycolysis or aerobic metabolism because clearly, as a result of accumulating ADPs, there is an energy demand in the body, right? So there's just some examples of this that we can see things like ADP, AMP, calcium, and then hydrogen ions, which are protons. So an H plus is literally just one proton that's floating around. Uh, usually accumulates as a result of lactate being produced through glycolysis. Very, very normal, right? So lactate gets a bad rep for being this like crazy evil thing, right? Well, really, one of the things that is disrupting homeostasis is not necessarily the accumulation of lactate, but the protons that it brings with it. So lactate by itself, not a big deal. Put it in an aqueous solution and a proton comes off of it. Well, that doesn't sound like a huge deal. Well, unfortunately for us, that proton actually starts to accumulate. And when that starts to happen, we start to see a drop in the acidity of the tissue, which can then affect the blood as well. So we actually see pH start to go down as hydrogen ions start to go up, right? Which can be problematic because we said things like enzymes often operate within an optimal range of pH. The blood operates within an optimal range of pH. So we start to see some problems there, right? So here's just some examples, certainly not all inclusive, but these are ones that you're gonna see over and over and over again. So let's go on to the next one. I love this figure. Please, please, please don't memorize this figure. It's ridiculous. But this does a really, really good job of illustrating how the presence or absence of certain chemicals throughout a various processes. So in this example, we're looking at carbohydrate breakdown, which can result in glycolysis or oxidation, right? And along the way, we can see the presence or absence of certain things might actually activate or inhibit some of these other processes along the way, which I think is just so cool and so neat. And it's part of that idea of coupled reactions where we see all this crazy stuff going on at once, right? So for example, if we have glucagon, epinephrine, norepinephrine present in the bloodstream, that will start to increase and start activating things like the breakdown of liver glycogen to start increasing plasma glucose, right? Plasma glucose can eventually make its way into the bloodstream if it goes into a conformational change and can be used for storage or for oxidation later on. But again, we can look at a number of these different processes and see, okay, what is actually stimulating or inhibiting some of these effects. And a lot of the times it's the accumulation of either products or reactants. So it's pretty, pretty cool. And uh, again, by no means should you memorize this, but I think it's a really, really awesome illustration. And this is just one, one example, right? This is just glucose being broken down potentially. So you can imagine there's hundreds of thousands of millions of other processes that we could talk about and make charts just like this. So again, just to illustrate presence or absence of certain things can activate or inhibit downstream other things, pretty cool. Another way that we regulate um, homeostasis in the cell. Now, hopefully, no brainer, you guys already know, when we do some type of exercise, especially overloading exercise, homeostasis of the body and our body systems is disturbed, right? We know that not all things are equal in terms of driving the adaptive processes. There are some signals in the body that are more disruptive than others and have a more potent effect on driving some of the cellular adaptations and communication that regulate homeostasis. So in the long term, we said, one of the big strategies in regulating homeostasis is making adaptations to exercise that we have encountered and overloaded at previous time, right? So what we find is that there are some stimuli that are very, very potent in terms of driving cellular adaptive processes. And we call these primary signals, meaning they happen instantly at the onset of exercise generally, and they start kind of a snowball avalanche type effect in terms of cellular communication. And we'll get to that a little bit more in a second. So a couple things, and this is the short list, a couple big primary things. Muscle stretch and tension. So this happens basically instantaneously when you start exercising, right? Once you start doing some heavy exercise, whether it's running or sprinting or weight training or even sport training, you start to generate tension in the muscle, you start to stretch it out. This is something that happens within literally milliseconds, your body picks up on it. And when it hits certain thresholds of stretch and tension, it actually starts generating a cellular signal, usually a chemical messenger that says, hey, I am encountering something that's pretty rough, pretty messed up right now. I might start to need to make some changes in order to maintain homeostasis in the short term and in the long term, right? 
Changes in calcium. So if you ever see that uh, written with brackets like that, that generally means concentration. So we can see the concentration of calcium, which is very, very important for muscle contraction. So when we see calcium increases in the, uh, in the muscle cell, that's usually as a result of really, really forceful contractions of the muscle. We can actually see differences in calcium concentration depending on how the muscle was contracted. So in many cases, if we start to see kind of higher uh, very slightly elevated, higher resting baseline levels as a result of like consistent stimulated contractions, we can actually start to see changes to making a more fatigue resistive state of that muscle as a result of doing endurance type, excuse me, type activity where we're not contracting the muscle super hard, calcium spilling into the muscle, right? But it's not really going crazy. It's just kind of elevating a little bit uh, at activity and at rest. So it's just a slight change, right? When we see big peaks and valleys in calcium concentration, that's usually when we're doing really powerful or really forceful movements. So that would be an indicator to other cellular regulators saying, hey, this person's generating really, really big forces. We might need to actually help them get stronger or more muscular or maintain muscle mass in the long term so that this isn't so brutal next time. And then one of the big ones, again, that operates very much on negative feedback and chemical messengers are energy balance. Energy balance is a huge cellular signal. What we usually are looking at is the ratio of products and reactants. So usually what we see is when things like ATP are very high, glycogen very, very high in the cell, the energy demand is low. Why? Because they're not being used up, right? So if our resting concentrations are kind of at normal levels or are very close to being full, there doesn't seem to be any indication that an energy demand has been generated. The problem that we run into is when we start to accumulate things like ADPs, AMPs, as a result of breaking down our ATPs, we start to accumulate products in a higher ratio than reactants, right? So now we're saying my resting concentration of ATP went down a lot, and I'm getting all these byproducts, right? That is a cellular signal to the body that says an energy demand has been generated. And we can look at some other things, ADP and ATP are kind of the primary ones, but some other things like NADH and NAD plus also serve as an example for this. And this is an indicator that a significant energy change has occurred within the body and we need to start regulating energy balance, metabolism, and homeostasis. So really, really big signals. So we know that there are hormones and cell receptors on the surface that can alter some of these signals. And what ends up happening is as a result of these primary signals, right? So again, these happen instantaneously, virtually, right? Right at the onset of exercise. What ends up happening is these signals lead to what we call secondary signals, which are kind of starting to form a bigger snowball leading to a big avalanche, which is going to be protein synthesis later on. So what we find is that these things kind of start, it's kind of like the match that lights the fire, right? So we say these things happen, and then very shortly after this, on the scale of like minutes, we start to see some other things happening. Let's take a look. So these initial primary signals start to trickle, excuse, trickle, trigger what we call secondary signals, right? Secondary signals are what most people are more familiar with after kind of getting a rudimentary exposure to some of the scientific literature. This is where we can start to see things like AMPK, adenosine monophosphate, activated protein kinase. Ugh, did I get that right? It's a big mouthful. I think I got it, hopefully. We can see AKT, mTOR, a number of other pathways that regulate things like either uh, maintaining energy balance or developing a more fatigue resistive state, which is AMPK. And then AKT mTOR is more on the uh, anabolic side. Can we build structures back up? Can we repair damaged tissue? And can I make my person bigger, faster, stronger kind of adaptations? We also see a number of other ones like calcium calmodulant uh, dependent kinases, IGF, PGC alphas, all sorts of other stuff, right? And here what we see is essentially we've picked up the primary signal at the onset of exercise. Something changed, energy changed, stretch and tension changed, calcium changed, something like that changed. All of which can be picked up by either chemical messengers, pressure sensors, things like that, right? Then we start to see the secondary signals become activated based on whatever stressors were experienced. And when these become activated, now we start to see a very, very powerful downstream effect leading towards transcription and translation. So let's go on to the next slide. We see a diagram here. Here, and this again is from the uh, You Can Drip Sport Nutrition book. Here we see we had some type of training stimulus. We had some type of signal. It could have been stretch, calcium, leading to AMPK, energy changes, any of those type of things, right? Essentially, that leads to this transcription translation process where we have started to say, you know what? I encountered a stressor. I have made a signal cascade. I've made hundreds of thousands of chemical messengers, all of which are saying, 
Big James here needs to get stronger or more jacked. Mm, working on it. That goes all the way down to the cellular level, to the nucleus of those cells. And it says, you know what? We actually need to change who he is to some degree, right? You are, you are who you are. We have a blueprint of who you are, but we're going to modify that blueprint a little bit and say, you know what? I'm going to say James needs to get more jacked in his biceps. So they're going to start transcribing little chains of DNA that start to signal the processes that make you more jacked, right? So what we end up seeing is, again, this process of DNA replication. We get an mRNA. It gets sent out goes to a ribosome, turns into a protein, and then that gets sent out to do whatever it is it needs to do, right? And starts activating other cells throughout the body. Or it could actually lead to skeletal muscle protein synthesis in some cases, which is great, which is what I want. So here's just kind of a rudimentary example of what this kind of looks like. And now we can start to see how these chemical messengers have really, really cool downstream effects where we have a primary signal leads to secondary skin signals. And then we see this like sort of avalanching effect all the way making its way to the DNA, uh, the, excuse me, the nucleus of the cell where we're actually starting to replicate little portions of the DNA of the cell that say, you know what? Let's get those biceps bigger or let's make him faster. Things like that. Make sense? Pretty cool. And again, this is like the, the short version, right? I've taken entire courses on how DNA is replicated. It's a very, very deep, crazy, crazy, crazy complex process. But this is kind of the nuts and bolts of what it looks like. Now, there is a time scale for some of these events, right? So we know the initial response to exercise, which is our stressor disrupting homeostasis, occurs within seconds to minutes, right? You start exercising and we see those changes, tension, stretch, energy charge, they change instantly, right? And last for a few minutes. The cascading events that take place after may take several hours to reach maximal activity. So what we see is things like gene expression seem to peak somewhere around four to 12 hours after the initial stimulus. And then protein synthesis, which is the actual replication and um, physiological changes that are occurring as a result of whatever training that you did. So this is where the adaptations are actually starting to manifest in your body. This tends to actually peak much later on, somewhere around 48 hours on average, plus or minus, for most people. So what does that mean? That means when you go and do exercise, right? You're going to get an acute response to the exercise. But a lot of the changes, the chronic changes that are occurring from that exercise are actually taking place days after you experienced it, right? And that can vary depending on how overloading the exercise was and this and that, there's some wiggle room in there. But what we know is for the most part, you're not getting bigger, faster, stronger, leaner, more fatigue resistant in the minutes following exercise. It's really a longer process, right? Transcription translation will be occurring for the next you know, four to 12 hours or so. And then protein synthesis will be peaking, which is again, the phenotypic, the expression of those traits into your body, uh, accruing those traits onto your actual self that will occur around 48 hours later, kind of like the next day or two, which is really interesting, right? Sound familiar? Like DOMS? Mm, maybe related. Let's look at the next one. So here is just a graphical representation of this timeline. And I love this. I think this is a great figure. I've used it in multiple classes. And the thing is, that really irks me, you know, when I, you damn kids and your cell phones and your Xboxes, when I was in school, we didn't have this kind of stuff, right? We had to just figure this shit out because it was not very well understood at the time. Now you guys get like handy, beautiful blue charts that just tell you everything you need to know, right? But in reality, this is actually very important. And this kind of gives you an idea of the time scale of not only homeostasis and regulation, but also chronic changes and ad the adaptive processes as well. So again, just to reiterate, we see that first one, that primary signal occurs within kind of seconds. The signal cascade from the secondary signals and, and everything after that occurs kind of on the scale of minutes. We see transcription and translation of those new traits that we want to manifest occurring on the scale of hours post the overload stimulus. And then protein synthesis and the real expression of those traits only occurs days after we did the initial stimulus, which is really, really neat. So we can kind of see kind of a short-term scale and a long-term scale effect on homeostatic regulation. Pretty neat. And again, this wasn't around when I was in school, so you should get this tattooed on your lower back from this point on. Okay? So again, what we want to differentiate here, and this is something you're going to learn more and more as you take more exercise physiology courses at RPU, we want to differentiate acute responses and chronic adaptations. And both are used to manage homeostasis in the short and long term, right? So acute physiological responses to stressors maintain homeostasis in the short term. That means 
your respiration went up, you started breathe, your, your oxygen demand went up as a result of doing exercise, you start breathing more to accommodate that, right? Things like that. You're starting to use more carbohydrate where well, we activate more of the enzymes involved in glycolysis, right? Short-term effect, normal. What we see when we're talking about chronic changes is when we have overloading stimuli that we need to, well, not necessarily need to, but we want to adapt to in the long term, right? So we had something that generated a physiological strain. We said, you know what? I don't want that to be as brutal the next time I encounter that. I need to make a change, right? This is a chronic change over time. So chronic physiological adaptations to stressors maintain homeostasis over time, whereas acute stressors are managed by physiological responses. And you're going to learn more and more about that as you dive deeper into exercise physiology. So again, Exercise physiology is a field where we kind of seek to catalog all of these different responses and various adaptations that we make to exercise under as many conditions as we can possibly figure out, right? Can we do the same conditions, or excuse me, same exercise at altitude? Can we do it under low pressure conditions? Can we do it in heat? Can we do it under dehydrated conditions? Can we do it under all sorts of different things? Everything that we can possibly catalog that results in a stressor a response relationship or in a chronic adaptation relationship we want to catalog. That's what a lot of exercise physiology comes down to. Like, what can I show happens when the, when you exercise like this, right? Whereas sports scientists, we think that's awesome. We think that's really, really valuable. But we generally are seeking to systematically enhance athlete performance by kind of maximizing the potential for some of those adaptations. So we say, you know what? I'm a sports scientist. You're an exercise physiologist. You're my homie. I need to know how to make my athlete the most successful at sport. Generally, I need them to be bigger, stronger, faster. How can I make them those things, right? Exercise physiology helps us understand what things make those things. Sports scientists, uh, excuse me, sports science helps us figure out how to implement those in the most systematic, periodized, face potentiated manner possible to get the best results, all of which yield to improved performance. That's what we're primarily concerned with. So very, very close, very, very related, um, slightly different approaches to how we go about it. All right, that's it. We talked a lot about homeostasis. Hopefully you guys have a really, really good understanding of some really basic negative feedback kind of control mechanisms. We talked about some chemical messengers. We talked about um, products and reactants, things like that. And this is going to serve you really, really well in some of the later courses when we talk more and more and more about things like overload and stimulus recovery adaptation and how those things are related. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for the next one, RP Plus RPU. I will see you soon.